This is EN2041 Thermodynamics, Lecture 10. So now it's time for us to start looking at steam. And I know a lot about what students think about steam and the theory of working with steam and the inherent problems of understanding the calculations that we do with steam. I know you struggle with this. Um, I know you struggle with any kind of phase change material and um, I, I can completely sympathize with it. I struggled with it myself. It's a long time ago since I learned it, but I, I certainly remember not really knowing what was going on, not really having any idea why we were doing it and just simply memorizing how to do, to do calculations. That's a real shame because this theory is really interesting and it's also um, terrifyingly powerful. I'll show you a video in a minute um, of some steam being, being vented from a power station and you'll see just the huge amount of energy that we can we can store within steam. So if you if you can understand it, it, it really opens opens a whole world to you of, of how uh, modern energy generation systems work and historically how they've worked as well. So I know that you don't really understand this and that's okay. What we're actually going to do is we're going to start from scratch again. So if you learned this in your first year and you didn't get it, that's fine. We're going to start from scratch again and we're going to go back through all of the data and we're going to see how to, how to learn the steam tables. So what we need to do is first of all, understand what steam is. So my confession is when I was a student, I didn't know what it was either. Okay. So I, I didn't, really understand what the lecturer was saying. I had this bizarre picture in my head of almost like fog and I thought that's what steam was and I thought that's what stupid superheated steam was. I clearly I didn't get it and I, I'd like I'd like to think that there's a lot of students out there as well that have the same terrible model in their head as mine. So let's break that away. That's what that's all we're going to do in this lecture really is understand what steam is. And then from there, we can start doing calculations. Okay, there's a video coming up. And what this is, is, is called a safety blowdown. So in a, a modern power station, they have to test that the safety valves work on the steam system. So they do something that's great fun. They charge everything up to a reasonable operating pressure, and then they lift off the safety valves. And this is a, a power station being commissioned in China, I think. And they're just testing, so they're, they're constructing the, the power station and they're building the, the steam plants and, and the boiler tubes and everything at the same time. So what they did is, is a, a, a test of the, uh, the steam safety valves. You can find videos like this all over YouTube just in case you want to try and understand it a bit more. So it's, it's called a blow, a steam blow or a blowdown test, things like that. Now, what I want you to do is, is just look at the ridiculous amount of energy that's being dumped out of these steam pipes when they're, when they're vented. And this isn't really superheated steam because you can see it, so it can't be superheated. And we'll talk about what superheating means later on. What I just want you to, to do is, is look at the scale. So look at the size of this steam plume because it must be about three or four meters in diameter because it's it's as big as a whole story in in this huge building it's coming out of and just imagine what what would happen if you were standing next to it you can see nobody's standing anywhere near it because of the amount of energy that is coming out of these things and that's why we have to learn it as engineers because this is how we generate electricity we in in the case of thermal systems we heat up water turn it into superheated steam and we kind of vent it across a turbine all right so so that's one of the problems is in teaching this is it's almost impossible to show you anything because you can't see inside a steam turbine so have a look at the the energy coming from just a steam blowdown which is probably you know 10 percent of the energy that's actually going through a power station but it gives you an idea of, of what we're dealing with here All right, scary stuff. Hopefully you looked at the scale and thought that's that's a little bit mind blowing. That you know that that plume one of those plumes was bigger than you or I. Um if if you'd have put your arm in it it would have ripped your arm off and that gives you an idea of the scale at which we normally use steam for in a modern context. 
when we're talking about ancient steam engines or ancient Carnot cycles, that kind of thing, we'll 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 dip in and out of history as we go. Then that's a different matter. But but the the modern use of superheated steam uh, is is for very very large scale. Uh, we're, we're almost into gigawatts, pretty much. Uh, it's it's that kind of a scale of energy. All right, so let's have a look at our learning objectives for this session. What, what I want you to do is, is understand the properties of steam. So after this lecture, you should be able to describe steam in a much more intelligent way than how you're probably describing it. I want you to understand the Carnot cycle. So we'll have a quick look at the Carnot cycle and then just look at some of the, the limitations of it. But we need to readdress our, our understanding of steam before we, we go any further. So we're going to look at a different methodology, a different kind of way of generating energy, and that's with steam. Now, what we've looked at so far in the first nine lectures or so, or in the, the preceding eight lectures to this one, is systems which are pretty much using air, but they're burning a fuel in that air. So the working fluid is air. And what I want you to understand in, in all of those cycles, whether it was the ideal air standard um, cycle for diesel, for Otto, the dual, um, the, the Brayton cycle, whatever it was, there was no phase change. It was all a gas. In fact, it's, it was a superheated gas. That superheated gas was called air. OK, so we're burning fuel in air. We're producing um, exhaust gases. But there's there's absolutely no doubt that everything was happening in a gaseous phase. OK, I think we can understand that. So now we're going to look at this 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 process called steam. So there's no chemical reactions here at all. There's no change in the chemistry of what's happening. All that's happening is we are turning a substance which under normal conditions is a liquid or perhaps under room temperature and pressure conditions is a liquid. That substance we call water and instantly by using the word water we start to introduce confusing terminologies. Water is the name of a liquid which comprises of the chemical formula of which is H2O. All right. Now, you know this, so I'm not I'm not telling you that. What I'm telling you is that that we get confused by calling things water and steam when all we mean is H2O in a liquid phase or in a gaseous phase. That's what we really mean. And that's where the confusion starts when you don't consider it to be such a thing, because water is a substance you interact with 24 hours a day. So perhaps occasionally I'm going to say H2O. I'm not being pedantic or silly. I'm doing it to stop you from confusing yourself. So if I say H2O in the gaseous form, I don't use the word steam. We don't start to get confused. If I say H2O in the liquid form, we don't start thinking about the properties of water. So in the case of where the working fluid is steam, it could be a liquid. It could be liquid H2O or it could be gaseous or vapor H2O. Here's some more confusion that I, I have to admit, even as a student, I didn't get this. The word vapor really means gas. OK, so when you see the word vapor, it means gas. It doesn't mean a visible uh, or actually in that plume that you saw in the previous uh, video that 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 strictly wasn't really vapor because you could see it. There must have been some liquid particles in there and then instantly the confusion starts. OK, so under some conditions, water or H2O exists as a liquid and under some conditions it exists as a gas and the confusion is is thereabouts pretty much. Also, steam has very non-ideal properties, so I can't just start using the ideal gas law. OK, I can't start writing the ideal gas law for steam under what we're going to look at. It does not work. Um, our conditions are far too extreme. What we actually need is a load of data to look at, not equations. Uh, so we'll have a look at the data. OK, <clears throat> let's start understanding a little bit about steam. So I'm going to do a bit of a silly exercise now. It might, you might find it a bit patronising. It doesn't really matter. It helps to get this idea across. I have to admit, before I even started teaching this to undergraduates, I think my perception was wrong of, of what steam is. So let's let's play this silly game now. OK, so so think to yourself. Take a minute if you want. Pause the video. What what is steam? What what does somebody mean when they tell you that they can see steam and they shouldn't be able to see steam? So what does somebody mean when they say I generate power with steam? Let, let's make it a little bit easier. Perhaps I should be asking you what isn't steam because this this material is so poorly understood by uh, 
engineers that aren't very good or people who aren't engineers. Let's let's look at examples where people say steam and they're not looking at steam. That's not steam. That is partially condensed H2O vapor. That is liquid droplets. This, the, the, that substance, that cloud that you can see in this picture, as far as we're concerned as engineers that are using a substance called steam to generate power, that thing that the arrow is pointing to is not steam. If you think that's steam, you won't understand the calculations. Okay. For the same reason, and also the steam that we were seeing on the video earlier, that wasn't steam. This is partially condensed water vapor. Where we're doing our work and our calculations, the, the steam does not look like that. And that is, a, and what you're looking at there is a power station that runs on a supercritical Rankin cycle. It generates energy from steam, but the plumes that come out of those cooling towers are not steam. They are something else. What comes out of a kettle? Not steam. Now, on that diagram, there is some steam. There is some pure steam. Now, you may know this. It depends on, on your previous education. The, th the stuff that you see rising out of a boiling kettle is partially condensed water vapor. You might be able to see the steam because it's the invisible bit. So have, have a really careful look at, the, um, at, at that picture right at the tip of the spout of the kettle. You notice you can't see as much of the plume. That's probably the steam in there, although maybe we could debate it all day. They're clouds. Clouds are not steam. Okay, there's steam all around us at the moment. It's superheated. It's, it's called humidity, but you cannot see it. What you are seeing there are clouds. They are not steam. Surprising how many people seem to get this idea wrapped around the wrong way. Okay, I'll stop being silly. As far as you are concerned, as far as the, the content of this module is concerned, when I use the word steam, I'm referring to a transparent gas that is either <clears throat> under, its, uh, under its critical conditions, uh, it is either um, entirely in the gaseous state or it's, or, or it's actually superheated. But in every case, steam is a vapor, which means that it is a gas. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to look at phase changes and we're going to call things dry steam and wet steam and that kind of thing. But in, until you get your head around the idea that once steam has gone beyond its boiling point, if you like, or, or, or once it's, it's, it's gone behind its saturated condition, which we're going to learn about in a minute, that stuff is what I like to call steam and it's a transparent gas. And in all of the pictures you've seen previously, you, you haven't seen it because you can't see steam. All right, what I'm gonna show you now is a video and this is great because this was actually used on some morning breakfast show on, uh, on, on an American news station. And they get a scientist in and he demonstrates superheated steam. And he does it in, in quite a logical way that you, you'd think he gets a boiler and a heat exchanger. And look at the, look at the fun that they have with it. It's, it's a bit of a long video, but it really helps you to understand because the point at which the, he actually uses the steam, that, that's pretty much superheated. So it's above 100 degrees C. So, we, so we, we're not worrying about phase changes and that kind of thing. We, what he's actually demonstrating is, is superheated steam. So this is the transparent gas part of it. Watch that video. That, that's going to help you with a bit of understanding. That, then we can get into to a bit of science. All right, let's get right into this. Okay, okay. Uh, take a look at this Mercury little contraption. Is rising here. I don't know how Kobrick missed this. You get the big leagues right now. We're talking <laughs> Bunsen burners and, uh, well, you uh, get everything. Okay. Right? So take a look at what happens. Yes. Um, most people think of steam as what we see right here. Can sure. you kind of yeah, see it kind of coming on. off right here? Right and there. If you can't see it very well, kind of against the black, there you, you can kind of see yeah. There it is. Mm -hmm. so, so there's our steam that's there. Steam is really just by definition vaporized water. Yeah, so think water, of like a vaporizer in the room. You got it. You yeah. got it. But um, steam, you know, you put your hand in steam, it doesn't necessarily catch on fire so mm -hmm. that's where the next part comes in okay so notice that we have this little part here bubbling. where it's bubbling so we have these uh, this water vapor here it's coming uh -huh. up through a coil of wire uh, uh, of copper 
tubing. Yeah. What's and now, going on there? What? How, how does that help? Well, we're going to superheat this, all right? Oh, boy. So, uh, this oh, is good, boy. Right? So this is yours. Look out. All right, hang on. Okay. You're good. Okay. All right, so now watch this. You go underneath kind of like this. Yeah. All right, and I'm going to come up on top. You're good. Okay. Life's good. Just right. hold it right there? Yeah. All right, so You're you making and I, me nervous, Steve. Oh, don't worry about it. You and I are now superheating it. Notice what's at the very end. You're not seeing any uh, of that water vapor come no, out stopped. anymore, are you? Right? Because I've been so focused on, on see, the bottom okay. right here. You're, Holding still. All right, so we are superheating this, which means that steam has the potential to take a tremendous amount of energy. So if you take a look at this right now, you can see it doesn't look like there's a, a, a lot of water vapor coming out. No. And in fact, we're getting it up to about 200 degrees Celsius. That's 400 degrees Fahrenheit. So kind of watch what happens. I'm going to hold this one here for you so you can let go of this. Okay. I'll hang on to it. Now here's what I want you to do. Why don't you get one of those matches in yeah. the tongs? All right? So get a match. By definition, the superheated steam is colorless and it's invisible. Just okay. get the match right at the very top there and right take there. a look at what happens. Let's see if it's getting hot enough. Watch what happens when we get... Oh, hey -oh. Did you look at that? That, you see that right there? That's steam. Isn't that just amazing? Yeah. So as we get close to it there, Ooh. about 400 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, and all we have to do is get close Smoke and start to catch it. Is that, go off, will it? Uh, no, <laughs> you know, they know it's Monday, right? <laughs> yeah, take they know take a look here. at the piece of paper. Okay. All right. You can actually take the piece of paper and put it right in there, kind of like, right yeah. Let's see if they can see on the camera what happens to that piece of paper. You can start to see. Oh, there can it is. See it? See that? It starts to brown. So firefighters have oh, to be yeah. especially uh, cautious of a real steam leak because yeah. steam is in, uh, insidious. It's invisible. It's colorless. It has so much energy inside. And mm -hmm. So that's kind of why they use steam for steam turbines and so forth. You can trap wow. a tremendous amount of energy. Now, if we stop superheating it, then all of a sudden you've got a situation where you, know, you can kind of see it again so we get this water condensation. This is kind of a nine news only demo. This isn't somebody somebody's going to rig up at home, you sure. know, just try I it home. Not. But, but <laughs> well, I don't know. We, we have gadgeteers that are out there. But I think it's absolutely amazing that when we think of steam, we can take a look at something like yeah. that. Oh, that's it's a good truly one. that powerful to be able to start a fire. Yeah, a lot of energy. It's and the bubbling's amazing. still the same as it was absolutely. when we started. Temperature down here about 100 degrees Celsius, but because we superheated it out there, it's about 200 degrees Celsius, 400 degrees Fahrenheit, catch on fire. Absolutely okay. amazing. Well, an excellent job of demonstrating what steam is by its nature. Um, I think I think they did a great job there. Okay, they used they used Fahrenheit as units, but we won't hold that against them. Um, and uh, I, I like the, the 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 piece of information he said at the end. This demonstrates the amazing amount of energy that we can put into steam. And I I, I was thinking that's that's a perfect way of, of illustrating why on earth. Uh, mechanical engineering students bother to study steam it's because we can put a huge amount of energy into the, into the steam so that's that's great i i do that experiment myself but i think he does such a good job of illustrating it that um that there's no point in me repeating it so thanks to steve steve spengler there for, for doing that for us all right so i'll go back to a point i made earlier which was Steam does not behave like an ideal gas, so I can't just apply some simple equations or relationships to steam in order to see what the properties of it are. What I really do need to do in order to understand steam from a from a, a, a purely theoretical level would to be do would be to do a huge number of simulations, probably in, in involving very intricate phenomena to calculate where I am. So historically, we didn't do that, and it would be unreliable anyway, and you might make a mistake. So historically, what people have done for us, which is very kind of them, is they have done a huge amount of experiments on steam at various pressures and temperatures and they've written all of these numbers down for us. So as mechanical engineers, we, we don't really care about the science that much. We just want to use the stuff. So what we need is a huge repository of data that tells me the enthalpy, i.e. the heat energy contained within steam, uh, the entropy, so we can uh, use our calculations in order to find uh, phase change points uh, and, and points of um, expansion for uh, turbines, if it's isentropic or not. Uh, we also need the relationship between pressure and temperature in there. So a whole huge amount of data is what we need, and it's all written down, and it's in our steam table data books. Okay. So these books, uh, you can probably buy them for about, I don't know, something like £10. Um, maybe secondhand you can get them a bit cheaper. The data is universal. It's the same. So don't worry if your book is 20, 30, 40 years old. As long as they're in SI units, it's absolutely fine. So you need a copy of that. 
I would recommend that you buy a copy because it's not expensive. So just get a copy and, and carry it around with you, knowing that if you have an, uh, a lecture with me, that you need to bring some steam table uh, data along to that lecture so we can look at it in the lecture. So somebody's done this for us and they've written all the numbers down. That's great. So it's got the entropies, the densities and all, all the, the different things at the different temperatures and pressures. So we also need to take account of the fact that under some conditions, and again, this is why steam is annoying, or what you'll hear me say in the lectures is steam is weird. It's, it's weird in as, in as much as it will exist um, as the, the gaseous form and it will exist in the liquid form. So again, I shouldn't have said steam, I should have said H2O. It's weird stuff. It, it'll exist simultaneously in two phases. And the previous video showed you that. They have the liquid and the gaseous state at the same time. So we need to take account of that. So sometimes the substance uh, contains 100% uh, liquid and sometimes the substance is 100% gas. So we have words for those and we call them dry and wet or respectively it would have been wet and dry. So 100% liquid is called wet substance, is called wet H2O. You notice how I'm struggling to try to put this across? It's because it's confusing. So uh, I guess we could say steam. So the, so the water in our kettle, when it's boiling, if you look at it, that's 100 degrees C. It's trying to change phase. So I would call that 100% wet. 100% wet steam, I guess, which is the same thing as water, but it's at 100 degrees, so it's just about boiling at, at atmospheric pressure. Then if I was to heat all of the water in the kettle up so that it's all gone away, but I retained it in some way, I guess that's 100% dry steam, both at the same temperature, but completely different in terms of their gas, in terms of their um, state, so, so whether they're a gas or a liquid, and also completely different in, in terms of the amount of energy that's gone into them. So ask yourself the question, has more energy gone into, the, into just having hot water or is there more energy in the steam? They are both at the same temperature. We're going to have a look at this in a minute. So we also use it as a, 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 a sort of a pre-calculated reference source. Now, I know you've already studied all this, but I also know that students come to me and they say, I really didn't understand steam. So that's why we're going through it slowly. OK, let's move on and, and let's, let's look at phase changes, that kind of thing. So ah, I'll change the head into water, might, might confuse you a bit more. So our, our power cycles are, are influenced very much by whether we are looking at H2O liquid or H2O gas. And in order to transform H2O liquid into H2O gas, we need a piece of engineering, which we call a boiler. And that's what a boiler does, okay? It turns our, our substance from a liquid into a gas. A, a kettle is a boiler, However, you're not using it to boil the water. You see, now, if you didn't understand that statement, that's because you, you're not following the, 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 the subject matter correctly. If I was using my kettle to boil the water, then when I, came, when I come back to it, there won't be any liquid in there. It'll all be gone and I can't make my cup of tea. So actually, a kettle is not a boiler. It's, it, it's a, a heater, really. But quite often... In layperson's terms, we use the term boiler, and we do not mean boiler, we mean heater, or the actual word is calorifier, and it means to put energy into a substance. But in the case of what we're studying in this module, a boiler means it turns something from a liquid into a gas. It does not mean that it just warms it up. Okay, once we've got that, that uh, I'm gonna say steam, once we've got the steam in a gaseous state, we want to keep it as a gas as long as possible and to use it whilst it's still a gas. We'll see why in a minute. We'll actually see why over the next few lectures. So what we do is we then heat up the gas and we call that superheating. And we're going to see that in a minute. The air in the room that you're sitting in is superheated because it's nowhere near being a liquid. If you cool it down low enough to just about 100 Kelvin, I think it becomes a liquid again. But you, you don't want you don't want that. And the, the air in, in, in the room is superheated. So we want steam to be superheated so we can use it as a gas. So therefore, we don't just boil it. We actually boil it and add a load more energy into it. And that's when we use it. So remember, the point of doing all this is so that we can use the steam to drive a turbine and then extract work from the turbine, just, just as in the Brayton cycle, I guess. But the working fluid in this case is, is a gas that we call steam. So the bit, the bit that we get confused on is this diagram, the temperature entropy diagram for, oh, look at that word, 
for H2O is what this is. It's not really the temperature entropy diagram for water, but it depends on the textbook you look at. You see all the confusion. It's a weird substance. We, we need to be clear on what we say. So this is the temperature entropy diagram for H2O somewhere around its phase change point. <clears throat> so you understand what an, an increase or decrease in temperature is. What about an increase or decrease in entropy? Well, entropy is this energy quality thing, isn't it? It's, it's, this, it's this symptom of energy being changed around and, and, and losing quality. And it's about how much energy that we get um, compressed within uh, a certain temperature band. And in some of our models, we like to say it's the amount of order or chaos, that kind of thing. So I'm going to describe what happens when we heat up H2O, when we change its phase, and when we superheat it. Okay, let's start from the basics. Let's get through some animations. So these are lines of constant pressure for any substance, pretty much. You'll recognize them because they look like the lines of constant pressure on the air diagram when we were looking at the Brayton cycle. So I'm just really trying to introduce the ground rules of what a temperature entropy diagram looks like when we have lines of constant pressure. So one of those lines could be atmospheric pressure, one bar, maybe one of them is. Okay. So this is H2O as a liquid. So we call this we call this liquid water if we want to. So this is the temperature entropy diagram of warming up water. This is what's happening in in our kettle when the water is just warming up. Okay. So there's no there's no phase change yet. There's no turning anything into steam. All we're doing is we're adding energy into a liquid, and that liquid is water. Okay. Logically, the temperature increases. Logically, the entropy is going to increase because we're changing the quality of the energy, aren't we? So we're, we're, putting, we're putting energy in, and as a result of that, maybe the molecules are vibrating more. Um, we, are, we are downgrading our energy from a compact source into a, into a more spread out source as we add the energy in. Okay. We don't need to worry too much about that. We just need to sort of describe this process. So we could move up and down that line all day. It doesn't really matter. The water gets warm, the water gets cold. That's what the TS diagram would look like. Okay. Then what happens at some point is that the phase change starts. Let's imagine, because it'll be easier for us, that we are at exactly one bar pressure. So we know what this temperature is. This temperature is 100 degrees C. Now, the, the theory is it's, it's the latent heat of evaporation, isn't it? So the latent heat of evaporation tells us that boiling, so-called boiling, phase change between liquid and gas for H2O under the conditions of exactly one atmosphere of pressure, that process takes place at 100 degrees Celsius, always under these conditions. It doesn't, it doesn't matter how much water is boiled off. It doesn't matter how long, how far along the process we are. It only occurs at 100 degrees C. It is a constant temperature process. And that, that's kind of a bit weird. It doesn't matter how, how quickly the energy goes in. It doesn't matter. It, it, you could just have a tiny couple of molecules left. The temperature will not increase until all of the phase change has taken place. So we get that constant temperature process. The entropy is changing like crazy because what's happening is that the gas, the, the, the liquid is being turned into a gas. The, the, um, uh, the, the, the molecules, if you like, are being liberated. There's huge spaces forming in between them and they're moving around really fast. OK, so the entropy is going to increase as, as a result of that. And whether you use your order and chaos model or whether you think about the units and think of it in terms of um, uh, joules per Kelvin, it, you know, you, you have to try to understand the temperature will remain the same. But this, the symptom of energy change, which is what entropy usually is, is changing hugely. OK, so we, what, I say, what we're saying is we're putting loads of energy into the process. The temperature isn't changing, but something is happening to the f to the fluid as, as the, the liquid turns into a gas. Something is happening that's allowing us to get energy in there manifested as an entropy change. And, and remember, 
the, the whole theory of entropy actually comes from somebody 200 years ago trying to understand this process. Okay, so then what happens? So now let's imagine that we're boiling our water and it's all gone. It's all turned into st steam, but it's in a sealed container. Okay, so in a sealed container, but I managed to just hold the pressure constant of one atmosphere the whole time. So now if we come all the way to the right of that straight line, that's dry steam, isn't it? There's no liquid left. It's all been turned into a gas. The far left of that horizontal line is wet steam. Okay, wet steam on the left, dry steam on the right. And anywhere in between, we're going, and I like to say we're going on a journey along the line of turning wet steam into dry steam. And we need a bit of energy to move along the line. And we're going to look at that later. Okay, so off we go. Now we're going to superheat our gas. So the steam is, we say saturated, what we actually mean is it's saturated with energy. It's, it's an archaic term, but we still use the term saturated steam. You don't need to worry about it too much. We're superheating the steam. So the steam is, as, as you see this curve going up on the right, the steam is completely dry here. It's a gas and to the naked eye, it would look just like air. Okay, I, I understand that, that at one atmosphere pressure, it's gonna be very, very hot, but it would look just like air, it's a gas and we're superheating the gas. We're just making the gas increase in temperature. Right, have a look at that shape. Saturated liquid water being warmed up. This process we call boiling or phase changing where we have pure fluid on the left and pure gas on the right, on this horizontal line, and then the superheating of saturated steam. That's the process at any one pressure. So throughout this process, the pressure has been maintained constant. Just imagine there's, there's a pressure relief valve holding it all at one atmosphere pressure, or we just effectively, we just allow the steam to escape out of the system. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to repeat this process over a variety of pressures. So I'll do this experiment, if you like, this thought experiment in our minds. We'll do it again and again at a series of different pressures, and we'll see what the resulting shape of all of the graphs looks like. There's our first pressure. There's the next one. That's probably at a higher pressure. So at a higher pressure, steam boils at a higher, higher temperature, or water boils at a higher temperature. That makes sense, you can, you can observe that. Things like pressure cookers will show you that. Uh, high pressure water circuits. So if, if I raise the pressure of, uh, of my water, I actually stop it from boiling. We use that a lot in engineering for cooling systems. Okay, you might see there's a slight difference in shape between them. I, I don't think I really care about this. I think a physicist will care about it. As an engineer, I just need to understand the shapes. Let's, let's throw some more in a, a variety of different pressures. Again, to reinforce this, what we're seeing is we're seeing this process of the heating of saturated water, the process of phase change, which occurs at a constant temperature, and then the process of superheating that dry steam once the, the, the H2O has all been dried out. And we're seeing this, each one of these traces is uh, uh, the, the, the boiling or the phase change process occurring at a different pressure. So what have I done there? I've now drawn a line through all of the points that interest me. That blue line, that inverted um, V shape that I know that you've seen before, but you probably didn't understand, is a locus of the points of interest. So it's highlighting all the points of interest. So, so really, if I knew something about that blue line, I don't need to get too um, excited about you know, all these processes I've just described, it really tells me everything I need to know. It tells me the point at which the, the H2O liquid is going to start to become a gas. 
It tells me about the amount of energy I need to put in. So a very good example. Look at, look at the highest black line. Now look at the lowest black line. You, can, can you see that there's a bigger entropy change or there's more energy required in order for the boiling to take place? So it gives me all the information I need. So what I might do actually is just get rid of all those black lines because I know that the blue line is telling me all of the points of interest. So there you go, it's gone away. Every time you see this, this curve from now on, I, I don't want you to just become mystified by it. I want you to realize what it's doing. It's showing you the locations of where the phase change is occurring, the dry point and the wet point. So if you like, on the, on the left side, so just cast your memory back to what you've seen previously, on the left side of that curve were all the locations of where we start to boil, but the, the, the steam, the H2O substance is wet. On the right side is where it becomes dry. Once I add any more energy on the right side of that curve, I'm superheating. Um, that, that saturated gas. So there's lots of points we can, we can put on this line and describe it, but you must understand how that shape arose or you're, you're pretty much wasting your time. So inside there, I must have a mixture. I must have a mixture of liquid and gas. Okay, this is again another point of confusion. What's going on in there? What's going on in there is I have a, a mixture. If I if I change the conditions in such a way that I start to go towards the left, the mixture gets wetter. If I change the conditions such that I start to go to the right, the mixture gets drier. If it crosses the line on the right it, and you add any more energy, you are superheating a dry gas or you're superheating dry steam. If I go beyond the left, I end up just with um, unsaturated steam and, uh, and, and water, or really uh, all I've got is just liquid water over on that point. I'll have a little bit of steam. We're going to study that next year. Um, it has to do with the ambient conditions based on the, the, the external pressures. But on the left, I've really just got, I've gone back to liquid. On the right, or above really, above and on the right, this, this isn't exact, this is an approximation like everything else I teach you. Above and on the right, superheated conditions. I need that. That's useful to me if I'm generating electricity. So we call this the saturation curve. Any data along that point is extremely useful to me because it's telling me when I'm, I'm seeing a 100% phase change in any direction. So that's useful. And it takes away all the worrying about where the steam is as long as I know the saturation curve. So your data books your steam table data books, many of the pages in there are just simply telling you where you are on the saturation curve. That's all it is. That's an interesting point at the top, isn't it? So if I exceed the conditions in such a way that I'm above that top point, I don't really get any of this boiling stuff. It's just always a gas. So actually, when you really superheat, you get so far away from the critical point that it, it, it's, almost, um, uh, it's almost beyond worrying about whether it's liquid or, or gas. Once you're above the critical point in terms of pressure, it always um, just, just pretty much turns directly from a liquid into a gas. Mm, again, the physicists will worry about this. We don't need to worry about this. Um, all of the, the information we'll look at in terms of phase change will always be below the critical point, but at least it's worth knowing what it is. So here's a nice diagram demonstrating everything um, that, that, that you'd probably ever need to know. Um, if you have any difficulty seeing things in, in colours, if you have a, a disability that causes you difficulty for seeing things in colours, please come and speak to me. I, I'm sure we can find uh, black and white versions of this if it helps you. So what we're looking at in here are um, all of those journeys all superimposed on top of each other. So you can see, let's start with, let's start with a, a blue line. Okay, so, so choose pretty much any blue line. Let's run along the top. Oh, there we go, just, just off to the right, maybe three off from the right, there's the one bar line. So the one bar line is actually atmospheric conditions. Okay, so you can see that if you start all the way over onto the left, we, we, we see just what we've done before. You warm up some water, you then it, it then becomes as um, 
saturated wet steam, you then dry the steam off by going towards the right. You, you hit the, uh, the saturation curve on the far right, it becomes uh, dry steam and then you superheat it. And these are all done for different pressures on the blue lines. Okay, so, well, the green lines are lines of um, specific volume. We're going to do that later. It's a bit like density. Um, we can see the, the, the curve, the thicker red line that sits over the top of everything. That's obviously the saturation curve. And there's some nice little red curves sitting in between them. You notice that this symbol is X, and X is the dryness fraction, isn't it? X is the dryness fraction. So look all the way over to the right. It says X equals 1. So dryness fraction of one means pure dry steam. Great. Go all the way over to the left. The dryness fraction drops off to naught. So that would just be what we call wet steam or pretty much just water at the boiling point. So we can see that the dryness fraction increases as we go from left to right. This is important to us as, as engineers because we're going to use the value of dryness fraction to calculate things relating to our steam cycles. So what I really hope is happening now is you're looking at this and saying, yeah, I understand what this curve is. And 20 minutes ago, you wouldn't have had the first idea what it meant, even though you studied it before. Now, if, if you still are completely bemused by what this means, I think you need to go into a textbook, have another read. By all means, come and see me uh, go back over this this lecture. But you have to you have to stop at this point if you don't fully understand what the nature of this diagram is and why it's useful to us. So if we're going to use this in a power generating application, we need to be up in the superheated region, uh, you know, far up on the right as we can, which means very high temperatures, very high pressures in many cases. But in order to understand it, we're actually going to do a lot of our work inside the saturation curve, which is a bit silly because you wouldn't really do that. 200 years ago, they were inside the saturation curves because they couldn't engineer systems with high pressures uh, or, or could withstand high temperatures. So a lot of their work was inside there and their, their steam engines were, were, well, they were rubbish and, and you should understand that. So we're going we're gonna to sort of follow their science and their engineering in order for us to understand. And then we're going to go into the superheated region, but that, that's in another lecture. So our, our tour of, uh, of, of famous thermodynamicists would have to start with Carnot. So here's, this is Louis Sardi Carnot, I believe. Um, oh, there we go. Nic Nicola, Nicola Leonard Sardi Carno. Sorry, I gave him the wrong name. Um, 1824, he came up with this idea. Uh, he actually used to work for Napoleon, did, did Carnot. Um, and he was, uh, he was kind of like a, a chief engineer in France. He, he worked on a lot of military projects. But one of the great things that Carnot did, us, did for us was he was one of the first people to understand thermodynamic cycles. <clears throat> Now, at the same time, people were developing steam engines. They just didn't have the first idea how they worked. And, and like I said to you before, in a lot of cases, well, maybe it's a bit of magic or, or maybe it's... They, they used to use this word called caloric, I believe, which meant um, thermal energy. And it, it was just a magical term. And they would say that steam was saturated with caloric when, when you couldn't uh, change its phase anymore, which is where the term saturation curve comes from, actually. Very confused... Whereas Carnot came in and said, OK, I think I've got some logical terms that we can put into this. So that doesn't mean that Carnot invented any kind of steam engine. He didn't. What Carnot did was he invented the first, I, I guess he's credited with inventing the first thermodynamic cycle. That doesn't mean that he was trying to um, perfect a steam engine in any way. He was trying to perfect the understanding of how heat engines work. And I think the thing that confuses us as students when we learn this is we think that this is related to the steam cycle. It's not really. It's related to what the ideal thermodynamics. So hopefully you can see why perhaps I should have taught this first. I should have taught this in the first lecture. But the only way to show it historically and practically is to deal with steam. But steam is too confusing to learn on day one. It's better to teach you about reciprocating engines, jet engines, and then we'll look at the Carnot cycle, even though Carnot is the, the fundamental understanding of heat engines. 
Okay, let's not confuse you too much. So with our previous, you know, standard air cycles, that kind of thing, the Carnot cycle consists of four non-flow processes, and we don't really care about phase change in here. But what we're going to do is, because we're a bit more comfortable with heat engines, is we're going to take the Carnot cycle and we're going to dump it over the top of our understanding of steam. So imagine our saturation curve, the, you know, the red curve from the previous slide. We're going to dump the Carnot cycle on top of that and we're going to try to build a theoretical steam engine. If we did that, it would be the worst engine you can ever imagine. It would be rubbish. But the point is we can understand the theory now. So the Carnot cycle, very similar to the diesel cycle, the auto cycle, the Brayton cycle, it's going to consist of four processes and they'll all be non-flow. But I want you to look at the four processes and just understand what is driving them or, or what they consist of. So we're going to compress a substance and all right, we're going to apply it to, to steam, but it doesn't really matter. You could apply it to anything, argon, air, I don't know, treacle, it doesn't matter. It's a, it's a substance having the following things done to it. When we compress it, that compression will be done under isothermal conditions. The temperature won't change. So think about what we've seen previously where the temperature didn't change. Then we're going to add he uh, heat adiabatically. Okay, so it won't cross any boundaries. Then we will expand isothermally and then we will reject heat adiabatically. Okay, we, they're theoretical terms. Let's not get too confused. Let's have a look at some diagrams so that we can understand it uh, a bit better later on. So that's the Carnot cycle. It doesn't have to be applied to steam and we've We've seen before, we've, we've actually, in the lectures, we've tried to apply it to um, air and gas turbines, that kind of thing. But we're going to use the Carnot cycle as a model to understand how we might build a steam-powered heat engine. So let's start here. So here is the Carnot cycle applied to saturated steam. And in real life, we don't do this because it would be rubbish. So you might be sitting there thinking, then why are you teaching this to us? <laughs> because it helps us to understand how this process works. Once you understand it, then the logical expansion is to apply it in a practical way, which is what the Rankine cycle is, and we're not doing that today. So let's theoretically try to build a Carnot engine using saturated steam. Okay, here's our saturation curve. Here's our temperature entropy diagram. We understand this very well because we've proven that to ourselves. So let's now play around with some steam and build an engine to live inside our saturation curve. So ask yourself the question, what's that line doing? You should know. From one to two. What, what do we call that? We call it boiling, don't we? That's boiling. So a boiler in a mechanical engineering context, not in a, um, a maintenance engineering context or, or just a heating context, a boiler changes something from a liquid into a gas. And when it does that, its temperature does not change. And the reason it doesn't change is because fundamentally it doesn't change. When you boil water, atmospheric pressure, its temperature does not change until it's been completely boiled dry. But in the Carnot cycle that we're doing this way, you don't do that. You just boil. Okay, next step. So the next step will be under ideal conditions. So it's, um, it's adiabatic, but it's also isentropic. So we have isentropic expansion. So now what I've got... In my, in my engine, so we're, we're gonna constantly move between the ideal concept of the Carnot cycle and trying to build a heat engine that lives within the saturation curve. So what we do now is we would put it across a turbine. We've dried the, 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 the H2O out, it's not superheated because it hasn't crossed the line. So we've dried out the H2O and now we're gonna put it through a turbine. So we'll do that isentropically, we'll expand it, the temperature will change, well it's isentropic, the entropy won't change, so the line just comes straight down. So now ask yourself another question, as soon as that line starts coming down, what happens to the H2O? What happens to it? Does it condense? 
Yeah, it starts to condense, doesn't it? What happens to its dryness fraction? The dryness fraction goes up. It will increase. Have a look, see what's happening between two and three. We're moving further inside the saturation curve. So that must mean some of the H2O gas is now turning into a liquid. That's what happens when you put the Carnot cycle onto the saturation curve. In a practical case, you'd never do this. It's a silly idea. But we are looking at a theoretical evaluation of the Carnot cycle inside the saturation curve. So we're going to do it this way. Okay, so we've expanded our liquid water. This is a closed circuit. This is not like the Brayton cycle where we're just sort of dumping it away. It's a closed circuit. Okay, next stage. Well, three to four is isothermal condensation. We've got to go this way. We have to go this way because we want to close the cycle. We're going to use the same water the whole time. There's no ejection to atmosphere or anything like that. We're going to use the same water all the time. So we, we need to sort of um, turn the water, ah, here we go, turn the H2O back into water. Aren't we? We're going to turn the H2O back into water so that we can complete the cycle. Notice temperature is the same. So this part of the cycle we call the condenser and even modern you know, billion pound power stations have condensers on them. So we are going to increase the dryness, the, we're going to decrease the dryness fraction even further. We're going to make the steam wetter because we need to get back to the, to, to the start. Okay, so we condense. That takes us more towards the, the liquid state. That's fine, between three and four. Okay, dryness fraction is going down between three and four. All right, so now what we need to do is we need to take our, well, it's, it's, it's a very, very wet mixture now at four. So it's a mixture of gas and liquid. Okay, let's say steam and water. Maybe, maybe we're, we're advanced enough to be able to use the terms and not confuse ourselves. We've got steam and water. We've condensed it as much as we can. Now what do we need to do? Well, we need to get it back into the boiler. Okay, let's do that. So because we're using all the same substance on, a, on a, a continuously recycled process, we're not throwing any of it away, we need to get into the boiler. Well, we're going to, we're going to pump it, I guess we are. We're going to pump it, raise its pressure. So that's what we're doing. So, so imagine the turbine, it was dropping the pressure. It was, in, it was um, uh, decreasing the dryness fraction, so between two and three. So what we need to do now is get back up to pressure. So we're going to do that through an isentropic compression. And when we, when we do that, we're actually going to dry it out. So is the dryness fraction increasing or decreasing between four and one? The dryness fraction is, is, uh, is, is decreasing between four and one, isn't it? It's getting more towards the liquid state. So we're getting ready to boil it again. Okay, so that's what the TS diagram looks like for the Carnot cycle. If we were going to try to work within our saturation curve, so ancient history, you would have tried to do this. It would be a bit of a disaster. You're going to have wet steam all over the place and, and you're going to be kind of um, causing condensation and evaporation inside pumps and, and turbines. But that doesn't matter. The practical bits don't matter. This is what the Carnot cycle looks like if you apply it to the saturation curve. Some very important points. Have a look at, at the locations where the Carnot cycle is touching the saturation curve. That must mean that we've got some important and interesting data that we can use there. So another reason why we do this. Ask yourself the question, how easy is it going to be to find data relating to points one and two? They're at the same pressure. One is at the, the dry point, one is at the wet point, if you like. Very easy to find this data. OK, that's easy. So between one and two, the data is dead easy. And we're going to get used to using that data later on. And we're definitely going to go through it in the lecture. OK, what about the points three and four? Hmm, they're kind of they're kind of stuck, aren't they, in this sea? We don't really know where they are. But that's not strictly true, because the thing that we do know is their entropies. Their entropies are the same as points one and two. So point four's entropy is the same as point one's entropy. Point three's entropy is the same as point two's entropy. In fact, as long as I know the, the low temperature or the low pressure value at three to four, that's all I need. The entropies I've already got. 
So solving the Carnot cycle under these conditions becomes quite easy, and that's why we do the analysis in this way to start with. All right, let's keep going. So schematically, this is what it would look like. So you, you could pick up a lot of textbooks and they'll start with this on, you know, on the first page and you'll be very, very confused, but still. Um, we've got two locations of constant temperature. Sometimes we call them T high and T low. We've already touched on this in the lecture, so you, you, know, you can have some confidence in that, and you would have done it before anyway. I'm going to call them T A and T B. Boiling obviously occurs at high temperature. Condensation occurs at low temperature. And um, this is what a Carnot cycle engine would look like if you if you ever decided to build one. You'd have a boiler to, and, and the boiler's only function under these conditions is to boil. So this this is probably going to mess with your head a little bit. That boiler there where there may be a load of flames going in, that never changes temperature. All it does is change liquid into gas. The substance going through that boiler does not get hotter. All right, it actually gets hotter in, in the compressor, doesn't it? But that's that's fine, that's, that's how it's working for us for the time being. Okay, out of the boiler into the expander where we extract work in, in our case, or you know, if it was an ancient steam engine, this is this is what drives drives the wheels. Um, out of the expander, once we've, we've got what we want from it, into the condenser to get us to, to get us back to a condition where we can put more energy into the into the substance through the compressor to um, to dry uh, to um, drive it up to a condition where it's it's 100% wet and then we can boil it again. It might play tricks with your mind where you think, what's the point in having the expander and compressor? Why don't I just heat and cool down? It won't work like that. You you it will die thermodynamically. You have to dissipate the energy, don't you? Okay, that's what it would look like. Now let's just apply some rudimentary data to it so that we understand what's happening. And then from there we can expand on the theory. So remember, one of the great things about the Carnot cycle is it's very easy to see where work and heat are interchangeable. So heat exchange takes place in the boiler and it takes place in the condenser and nowhere else. Work exchange takes place in the expander and the compressor, nowhere else. We harvest work from the expander and we put work into the compressor. And you know what, it's very similar to the, um, uh, the Brayton cycle, isn't it? So remember that heat and work are interchangeable and they are balanced, but they only occur at discrete positions. So it's a closed cycle, isn't it? Water is being continuously recirculated. The water the, or the H2O doesn't go anywhere. It, it, it doesn't die. It, it doesn't suddenly cross the boundaries. It's the same H2O circulating around all the time. It's taken in at the lower temperature of TA and rejected uh, from the boiler at TB. Well, I don't need to dwell on these points too much because I've already done that. Boiling occurs at constant temperature. Boiling does not involve a change in temperature. Shut that out of your mind. Look at the diagrams. Let the diagrams guide you. And it's the same thing for the condenser. Condensation occurs at constant temperature. The compressor and the expander are obviously reversible, adiabatic and isentropic. It goes without saying because the lines are, are, are straight vertical lines. So they must be adiabatic and isentropic for that to happen. Well, we're quite a way into the lecture. Maybe it's time for us to do some thermodynamics. Let's let's look at some uh, let's look at some heat balance. So, liquid water at position one. So, if, if you're confused, have you know have a look at um, uh, have a look previously, or, or go on Learning Central, get get the notes, that kind of thing. Saturated liquid water at position one is evaporated in the boiler at constant pressure to form vapor, which is steam. <clears throat> and that, that's a position two, isn't it? So the heat added, well, the heat added is so simple, isn't it? It's just the change in enthalpy. That's all it is. So if you were to apply, uh, well, anything you want, steady flow energy equation, conservation of energy, it doesn't really matter. This is all you'll conclude. The, the boiler, which is, not, which is not a heater, it's the thing that causes the phase change. The amount of energy used in the boiler is H2 minus H1. So you can see why on a fundamental level, it would make sense to teach this first. But it's just too confusing. We have to understand other things first. Okay, that's all the boiler does. That's 
what a simple equation. It's just the difference in enthalpy. Okay, so the steam goes through the turbine. It's expanded isentropically through the turbine. Well, the work done in that is just, okay, it's the difference between H3 and H2. The negative sign in there is to take account of the fact that work is is uh, being extracted from the gas and you know in in the lectures we always talk about what what is our sign convention and I always tell you I don't really mind as long as it's consistent okay the steam does work on the turbine and that gives us um, a usable energy so we, we give it a negative term because it's it's it, it's doing work on the turbine work is being extracted from it again it's just the difference in enthalpy between three and two it, you know, and that's a heat energy difference. Remember, this is a thermodynamic engine. We're not going to worry about uh, about the nature of work. We're just going to say it is manifest by the difference in heat energy. After the expansion, the steam gets partially condensed at constant pressure, um, and heat is 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 rejected um, at the uh, at the expander portion. Okay, so. Well, what does it mean to us? It's simple. Q34 is just H4 minus H3. Here's an interesting bullet point. Condensation stops when S4 is equal to S1. And you might say, well, that, that seems a, that's a bit obtuse. Well, the, the condensation stops when, when we decide that the entropies are equal. Yeah, let, let's do it like that for now because this is theoretical. We're applying a theoretical concept to it. So it stops when we say, and we, we've decided that we want to keep isentropic conditions to satisfy Carnot's theory Remember, that's, Carnot is not a steam engine designer, he's a thermodynamicist, and he says we will use isentropic conditions for the expansion and compression, so we'll stop the condensation when S4 is equal to S1. So, simply, the steam going uh, isentropically through the compressor uh, is the difference in enthalpies between 4 and 1. Uh, taking into account adjusting the sign to make sure that we're uh, taking into account of work being uh, uh, being done on the substance. So all I've shown you, despite all the theory and all of all of the concepts of us trying to understand what on earth steam is, all I've shown you is, is a, a work and heat balance where we just look at delta H each time. That's all it is. I've just given you four formulas, which is basically um, energy exchange equals delta H. That's it. That's all we need to know for this. And then we try to apply this simple concept to horribly complicated steam problems. So we can look at the whole system as four thermodynamic process. And in the same, almost in the same way as what we did in the Brayton cycle. So the net amount of work provided by this cycle must be the difference between the, um, the expander and the compressor. So what's left over is what we can harvest. Great. The system is in thermal equilibrium because we've said that, that we're going to draw a control volume around it, which is adiabatic. So the steady flow energy equation is just going to tell us that the heat and the work are balanced. I put heat in, I take work out, and in order to complete the cycle, I have other heat and work processes and everything's in balance, just like a heat engine would be. I burn something, it gets hot, I apply that energy to the steam and I take work out of the steam. So all we have is four terms, and each term is delta H. It doesn't really matter how it goes in, it's a delta H form, and they're all in balance. Great, easy. It's only complicated because we're doing this with steam and it has phase change. Well, the efficiency of the process is pretty much as the Carnot efficiency, isn't it? We're, well, we're looking, for the, we're looking at the Carnot cycle, so it must be. So the efficiency of the process is the difference in the work divided by the amount of heat energy we put in. We've already studied this because we actually looked at it for the Brayton cycle, although it's a bit backwards because what we should have done was the Carnot cycle first and then look at the Brayton cycle. Carnot cycle is too theoretical. You can't get your head around it until you, you've understood real things that you can see, like cars and jet engines. <coughs> we can also express, don't forget, we can also express the Carnot efficiency as temperatures, can't we? We're not going to do the derivation. We don't need to. Just remember that the Carnot efficiency is that delta T term divided by um, what the, um, what is it? It's, it's the boiler inlet temperature, isn't it? So we know that the Carnot efficiency is just a function of temperature. And we've done that in previous lectures. You know, that, that's a good 20 minute derivation to get there. It, it's not relevant for now. We're simply just saying that's one way of expressing the, um, 
the efficiency of an ideal thermal engine or heat engine, which you've, you've done in previous years anyway. So work ratio, which might be, you know, a new term to us for steam, but we've already looked at, at work ratio with um, the Brayton cycle. So that's going to be the, the difference between uh, the compressor and the turbine versus what the turbine uh, is doing in the same way. So the work ratio is the same for both Brayton and um, Carno um, because it's, it's a concept, it's not cycle specific. So you should already know this. So here's a new term, specific steam consumption. <clears throat> this is important to us because we might be concerned about the size of our power plant. So somebody could tell me, I've got a really good efficiency, I've got a really good work ratio, and then they show me the design for the plant and it's enormous. And I say to them, that's nice, but I need this to go into a small space or I'm not happy with you saying that we need to use um, 40 inch pipes. Uh, that's an engineering term, sorry to use um, uh, old fashioned units. Uh, 40 inch pipes, because I don't wanna buy that much steel. What I want to do is I wanna make the system compact or I don't want to pump around loads of steam just to hit your high efficiencies. I'm prepared to take a hit on the efficiency if you can make the system practically small enough. <coughs> A brilliant example of this is the design of nuclear reactors for uh, ships or submarines. They've got to fit them in a small space and they've, they've got to work on good specific steam consumptions. There's a lot of power station applications in it. So what, what does it mean? Specific steam consumption is the, is the amount of energy that we get per kilogram of steam. Okay, so it's, it's the energy per kilo of steam. There's, there are derivations and I want you to look uh, these up in, in the textbooks, um, but what it actually drops out to is 3,600 divided by the, the net amount of work. Makes sense to me, really, because it's, it's so it's kilo, kilograms per kilowatt hour, right? So um, the 3,600 is, is coming from us converting seconds, which is an SI unit, into kilowatt hours, which is an energy unit. Um, you may need to have a little read up on this in your own time, or, or for now we can just look at the formula and understand that's what it is. But specific steam consumption is, is important to us. It, it tells us how much steam we need to use to get one unit of, of, of energy. So kilograms of steam used per kilowatt hour. It might be important to plant designers if they're worried about space or size or capital expenditure, that kind of thing. So if we look at the Carnot efficiency, it tells us what we already know. The wider the temperature range, the greater the Carnot efficiency. We know this. So just like in the same way for, um, for the Brayton cycle, this is controlled by metallurgical factors. I want to get the highest temperature I can, but I need to keep my, my um, temperatures within the, the metallurgy limits. Lower temperature isn't just dependent on, say, ambient conditions. It's actually a function of how cold I can get everything on the condenser side. The Carnot efficiency tells us that I need a big temperature difference. So now you can see why we do that absurd thing where we heat the steam up, we put it through the expander, and then for some reason we, we then cool it down. So it's almost like we put heat in and then we purposefully take the heat away. It almost seems wasteful. And to the layperson, they say, yeah, why do you do that? Why do you heat in a power station? Why do you heat things up? put them through a turbine and then cool them down again. Why didn't you keep everything nice and hot and then put them back in the heater? And then you say, well, it's because of the Carnot efficiency. I need to keep my delta, my difference, between one side of the engine and the other as wide as possible. So to get the best efficiency I can, I need something that cools my process water right the way down as cold as I possibly can without, without being impractical. I'm not gonna use a, a, a refrigeration system. I'm just gonna try and get it as close to ambient conditions as I can. I need to cool that water down because the Carno efficiency is based on delta T. And that is universal. It doesn't really matter what heat engine you, you build. In this universe, if you wanna build a heat engine, your efficiency will be dominated by delta T. So is there something in a power station that allows us to get the lowest possible return temperature that we can in order to maintain our Carnot efficiency. 
Yes, we call them cooling towers. That's what we do. So we take the the water or the steam or the H2O, let's call it H2O, <coughs> from the the expander and we turn it, and we're going to do this later anyway, we, we turn it into 100% liquid as best we can and then we make sure that we get that liquid temperature right down and that's what the cooling towers are used for. A lot of people, you know, find it very confusing. Isn't it weird? I thought you said you wanted high temperatures. Why do you cool the water? Because I'm trying to maximize my delta T. Okay, good. So let's have a quick look at what we, we're going to do um, with our steam table data. <coughs> so we're starting simply. We have a process where the upper and lower steam pressures are 30 bar and 0.04 bar. So that's the return pressure, isn't it? So that, that's just saying a, a little bit over ambient uh, pressure conditions. Right. Remember that 30 bar is terrifyingly high pressure. So that, you know, that steam dump video you saw earlier was, was probably something like that. It, it's, it's a ridiculously high pressure. We need that so that we can have a good pressure drop across our turbine. So in, in this, you know, it's easy for us to look at numbers like 30 bar on a, on a, on a piece of paper or on a screen. That's a very high pressure comparatively. Okay, so one half of the Carnot cycle is working at 30 bar, one half is working at, at 0 0.04 bar. So that's the, that's the pressure drop across the turbine, isn't it? So it's, it's a, a simple, idealized, saturated Carnot cycle. So remember back to the saturation curve and that square that we drew within it. So what we do to start with is we just go to the steam tables and say, OK, this is under saturated conditions in the boiler. I want the steam table data at 30 and 0.04 bar. OK, so T1 and T2, remember, constant temperature processes. Saturated steam at 30 bar, so that's the boiling temperature of H2O at 30 bar, is 507 Kelvin. If that was one bar, it would be 273, it would be 100 degrees C, wouldn't it? So it would be 373 Kelvin, wouldn't it? 373 if it was at one bar. At 30 bar, that stuff changes phase at 507 Kelvin. Okay, saturated steam at 0.04 bar. Um, the, the equivalent value in, in Kelvin is, is 302 Kelvin. Okay, good. So on our square that we drew inside the saturation curve, the upper part for this example, the, the horizontal line along the top at boiling is at 507 Kelvin and the condensation line is at 302 Kelvin. So whatever that is, about, I don't know, about 28 odd degrees C, isn't it? Okay. So I go to my steam table. So if you've got your steam tables in front of you, have a look at the data with me. And we're going to do all this in the lecture anyway. This is just to warm you up to it. So pause the video and go get your steam tables uh, or, or find something equivalent online. So I look at my steam table data and I say, right, OK. Oh, I seem to have two values for enthalpy. I don't have one. I've got two. Why is that? Well, one is the, the liquid enthalpy or the fluid enthalpy. Fluid in this case means liquid. So HF. So HF, the fluid enthalpy, is a thousand kilojoules per kilogram. That's the amount of energy that's embodied in that water at one. So at 507 Kelvin, so, that, so liquid, pure liquid water on the far left of the, um, of the saturation curve, <coughs> a 30 bar contains a thousand kilojoules per kilogram. Now we go all the way to the right of the, the saturation curve between 0.1 and 2 and we, we look at the value there. So that's, so H2, this is the same convention as the, the earlier diagram. So H2 um, is the gas, is pure gas, completely dry gas, and it's 2,803 kilojoules per kilogram. That sort of makes sense to me. I, I've, I've put a load of energy in there to boil that stuff, a huge amount of energy to boil it. So it's manifest in the fact that the, en the enthalpy in that case is almost three times higher. So there's a, there's a, there's a delta of 1800 kilojoules per kilogram. So I've put a huge amount of energy in there and I can see it now. OK, all right. So that was easy enough. Let's keep going. 
Now let's look at the entropies. And we have to remind ourselves S1 is equal to S4. S3 is equal to S2, isn't it? Take a minute, draw the TS diagram, put the saturation curve in, draw the square box. Label one to two along the top, uh, and then going from right to left along the bottom, three to four. Okay, so now once you've done that, you can, you can understand S1 is equal to S4 in terms of entropy, S3 is equal to S2. Also, I don't really need to worry about the other side. I just, calc I just find the entr entropies for S1 and S4. <coughs> so they're quite easy. S1, S1 and S4 are in my saturation data. I just write those values down. So S1 is going to be SF for fluid. And S, um, S2 is going to be SG for gas, isn't it? Just like you did with the enthalpies. Okay. So then what we do, we're going to do this in the lecture to make sure you understand it, is we take a little journey along that bottom line between 3 and 2 and we work out what the dryness fractions are at both cases. Now we're going to do this in the, in the lecture so that we understand it properly. I know you've already done this before. So if the, en enthalpy, if the entropies are given, we know what the entropies are because S4 was equal to S1 and S3 was equal to S2. Okay, so we, we've got those values. If we then actually look up um, what, they, what they would be if they were um, either saturated liquid or saturated gas, we can then calculate how far along the line each one of them is at the lower temperature. So under the um, uh, under the two and uh, under the two and four conditions, and then we just it's just a fraction of that value. <clears throat> we'll we'll do it in more detail in the lecture, and you will get the dryness fractions. So let's just see how we apply the dryness fractions. Okay, so we say the same thing. We say that the the dryness fraction is a function of how far along the boiling line we are. Okay, so we start on, on the left of the uh, saturation curve and go all the way to the right. The dryness fraction is a function of how far along we are from there. So we found them. So at, at point three, it's about 72% along the line. And at point four, it's about 26, 27% along the line. So now apply this relationship to say, okay, so the enthalpy I'm looking for would be the, the enthalpy in the fluid. And I add on to that the amount of energy I need to boil multiplied by how far along the boiling process I am. So see where it says now using H equals HF plus X HFG. It's the same thing uh, to, to do this relationship with enthalpy or entropy. It works in both cases. So as long as I've got X, which I've already found, which we're going to do in the lecture, all I say is, okay, if I want to find the enthalpy at position three or position four, I start on my line at the, the fluid point and I move along. How far do I move along the boiling line? Well, in the case of three, I move about 72%. And in the case of four, I move about 27% along the line. Okay, so that's exactly what I've done. So 121, so let's look at H3 only. <coughs> 121 would be the case if it was the, the, the fluid enthalpy. So I look that one up. I know what the temperature is because I found that previously. So it was 121 um, at, at the low pressure condition. That's the HF. Then I say, okay, in order to boil this fluid, I need 2,433 uh, kilojoules per, per kilogram to move along the line, but I'm not going all the way along the line. I'm going 71.6% uh, the way along that line. So I multiply it by that value and I get H3. And similarly for H4, it's the same calculation, but it's, it's only 0.276. <coughs> so don't worry if that didn't make sense because we're gonna, we're gonna do it very carefully in the lecture. So now, what have I got? I've got all my enthalpy values, so it's easy. All of the Carnot cycle theory was based around four processes and they're all just delta H. I've got all the H's, I just, I just chuck them all in and I get the answer. I can get efficiency, he, um, work ratios, specific steam consumption, everything. So I need you to to try the examples that we'll, we'll do later and we'll do in the lecture to, to make sure you can get your head around how to do that. The Carnot theory bit is easy. The difficulty is understanding the, the, the steam data. And we're, we're going to go over that in the lecture anyway. Okay. 
hope you now have an understanding for what we're going to do next. So we understand what steam is. I really hope we understand what steam is, what its properties are, and what would happen if we tried to build a Carnot cycle that worked under saturated conditions. The process of the Carnot cycle is ideal and, and it allows us to understand efficiency, but we know that uh, we wouldn't use it in, in, in reality. What we use in reality is something called the Rankine cycle, which we're going to do in subsequent lectures um, after, after we've, we've done the, the, the flip lecturing in, in our one hour session. So that should be everything you need to know. Um, I hope this makes sense to you. I'm, I'm happy if you didn't understand the stuff on the previous two or three slides, we're gonna, we're gonna go over it anyway. Just understand what steam is and what, what the nature of steam is.